Okay. So welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by uh, Tillman Spoon, who's come across to us from uh, Germany, uh, where he works at the uh, DLR, the German Space Agency in Berlin. Uh, uh, Tillman did his uh, PhD at uh, the Johann Wolfgang Goethe Institute in Frankfurt in geophysics. Uh, and uh, he has been a professor at the uh, Westfalisch uh, Wil Wilhelms University in uh, Munster. Uh, since 2004, he has been the director of the Institute uh, for Planetary Research for the DLR in Berlin. And in, uh, since 2007, he's been uh, the scientific uh, coordinator of the Helmholtz Alliance for the Development uh, of, of Planets and Life. Uh, last year, he won the EGU's Runcorn Florensky Medal for his fundamental research into uh, the study of internal structures and, and planets. He has been in the past uh, editor on the reviews of geophysics, uh, Earth and Planetary Science Letters, uh, and he's currently uh, involved in the construction of the treatise in geophysics and the Encyclopedia of Geophysics, which are going to come, in, uh, come out uh, next year. Uh, he's written uh, over 115 papers in journals and books. He is uh, also uh, a co i on the InSight mission, uh, which is what brings him across to California uh, on this occasion, uh, where he's been at JPL. He's in, car in charge of the heat flow physical properties probe on InSight, which is going to be launching in 2016. And uh, he's also uh, involved in the Bepi Colombo mission to uh, Mercury with the laser altimeter team. So we're going to hear about his research uh, now into the thermal uh, history of uh, exoplanets, planets, terrestrial planets, and uh, beyond. So please join me in welcoming Tillman. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. And thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be at this uh, World known institute, uh, SETI Institute. Uh, everybody knows the SETI Institute, I guess, in, 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 at least in the community. Um, I would uh, like to uh, walk you uh, today through um, uh, more of the modeling uh, research that uh, we've been doing uh, lately within the uh, Research Alliance. Uh, rather than you know, talk about the experimental work you know, in space uh, missions like the HP cubed or the heat flow probe on, on InSight or uh, the MUPUS on Rosetta or the laser altimetry uh, on, on Bepi Colombo. Uh, I'm actually you know, a modeler, uh, but I have uh, recently been, this, or since um, about 10 years, been interested in space experiments as well, so I'm, I'm actually uh, doing both. But today I would uh, you know, try to you know, walk you through the stuff we've been doing uh, lately. Uh, and it's covering a broad range, but um, you know, let's, let's see um, what uh, you know, we can sort of uh, uh, look at together. Uh, now, we start out with, uh, I, was, I understood that, um, you know, the, the first part of this uh, talk is, uh, has to be basic so that, you know, we can, you know, uh, don't have to be an, uh, an expert, you know, to follow uh, this. And at the end, I'm going a little bit more detail in a model that we recently developed on the interaction, possible interaction uh, of life with uh, the planet Earth, actually. Uh, and uh, its possible influence on the formation of continents and the water budget of uh, the mantle. But let's, uh, let me start out with uh, you know, more general statements um, that planets are heat engines. Uh, at least this is the approach that we're taking uh, that convert uh, thermal into gravitational and uh, deformational and kinetic field energy. Uh, but the engine is a part of a more uh, complex and uh, uh, system uh, that includes the, uh, you know, the, the um, processes uh, that you uh, see in this uh, uh, drawing at, at the site here, uh, where you have the biosphere, um, the uh, uh, hydrosphere, the crust, the atmosphere interacting in some way. Uh, then, uh, you know, the uh, crust, of course, is connected to the mantle through volcanism and the atmosphere uh, through degassing. If you have plate tectonics, then this is all coupled. 
uh, and you have uh, you know material that goes back into the mantle, and that is important in uh, cooling the core, convective cooling of the core. And the core would be then generating a magnetic field that would then, of course, interact with the whole system through the magnetosphere uh, and pro provide some uh, shielding for uh, the biosphere. And uh, of course, there is, uh, you know, outside influence, erosion by the solar wind, which is in part, uh, you know, kept off by the magnetosphere. Uh, and of course, there are impacts against which the magnetosphere, of course, is not uh, capable of protecting us. Um, now, um, many believe that habitability is, uh, or plate tectonics is uh, required for um, complex uh, and evolved life uh, on, on a planet. So it's an, an issue of habitability. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is, um, you know, some fold. Uh, plate tectonics recycles uh, near surface uh, rock and volatiles with the interior through subduction, which helps to cool the deep interior and generate a magnetic field in the core, uh, create uh, geologic diversity uh, through granitic cratons that will form continents and continental shelves. And the continents and continental shelves may uh, be of importance uh, for the uh, origin of life, at least the shelves. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it has been speculated by others uh, before that continents may actually be a biosignature. Uh, plate tectonics also replenishes uh, depleted surface rock uh, uh, as the base uh, for the nutrition chain, uh, and it helps to stabilize the atmosphere temperature in the carbon silicate cycle, and uh, as I said before, helps to generate a magnetic field. Now, um, if you are doing a theory of uh, terrestrial planets, uh, then from a thermodynamics point of view, treating it as a heat engine, uh, then you would have uh, several uh, elements in there, um, beginning with the interior structure. Uh, usually, we uh, think of planets being composed of an iron-rich core, a rocky mantle and crust. We have, uh, as you see in this uh, model of Mars here on the side, we have uh, phase transitions and chemical layerings that would uh, factor uh, in the convection structure in the interior uh, and therefore in uh, the transfer of heat uh, and the tectonic and internal evolution. Um, then we have the variation of uh, depth of thermodynamic and transport variables. And this, uh, as we believe at least, uh, should matter uh, if we look at very large planets, uh, for instance, uh, the exoplanets of super-Earth uh, that, that people are talking about. Uh, the interior dynamics uh, we, uh, is mostly uh, governed by mantle convection, although there are small bodies that are cooling uh, through conduction. But uh, I mean, if you go beyond a, a certain uh, size of uh, planets, then uh, convective heat transfer is uh, the decisive uh, element. And then you have volcanism, tectonism, magnetic field generation, and so forth. Uh, and some uh, planetary bodies, uh, you know, in the outer solar system, for instance, but also uh, is this, as is speculated for some of the exoplanets, uh, tides uh, play a role and tidal dissipation, the most prominent example being uh, Io. And of course, the rotation also factors in uh, the evolution of the atmosphere, uh, climate on Earth, and habitability through the seasons that. Uh, uh, you know, are generated by the inclined rotation axis. Uh, evolution of um, uh, a planet, uh, you know, goes from accretion uh, through differentiation, core formation, outgassing, basically through a cooling uh, phase, and this is basically where the planets uh, are in, uh, in which they then, you know, convert some of that thermal energy into other energy forms, as uh, I have, uh, you know, addressed uh, uh, to previously. Uh, in, in a, a previous slide. Uh, habitability in life, uh, the question of course is, is there a feedback between uh, planetary evolution and life? Uh, we know that that is true for the atmosphere, uh, at least of Earth, uh, where uh, it is pretty clear that um, the oxygen in the atmosphere is a consequence of uh, life on Earth. But the question, of course, is uh, does it go deeper in the sense of uh, uh, would a feedback uh, possibly include uh, uh, the interior? And I'm coming back to that uh, you know, further down in that, that talk. Uh, important elements of the theory uh, uh, include the thermodynamic properties and state variables. 
uh, where I highlighted in red, you know, some of the more important um, uh, quantities, although that is, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, depending on the angle you're looking at the, the problem. But certainly, uh, temperature uh, is important, at least for the small uh, terrestrial planets, more than pressure. This may change as we go for, uh, to super Earth, uh, where uh, the pressure can become so large that it would, uh, you know, affect, uh, possibly affect the transport properties uh, for heat and matter, uh, and thereby then uh, have a, a, a pronounced effect on uh, the interior uh, evolution. Composition, of course, is important. Uh, uh, it depends, uh, you know, whether you are talking about a silicate uh, body or uh, a thick ice layer, for instance. Uh, uh, although some of the phenomena are similar, uh, whether they occur, uh, like for instance, on Ganymede in the ice layer uh, or in the silicate shell, the mantle of a terrestrial planet. Energy sources, uh, we have accretion as an important energy source and differentiation. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, mostly uh, uh, of importance for the later uh, evolution is radioactive decay. About half of uh, the heat flow that is uh, coming out of uh, the interior of a planet uh, is accounted uh, for uh, by, uh, you know, radioactively uh, generated uh, heat. Uh, and while the other half is, uh, you know, due to previously uh, generated uh, heat or accre and accretion and uh, differentiation heat. Uh, there is, of course, a, a contribution by the latent heat of phase transformations, uh, but that is uh, small in comparison to the other sources. You may have tidal heating as an important uh, energy source, uh, but only for uh, those planets that are kept by um, you know, particularities of their orbits in, in, uh, in a situation uh, where uh, tidal heating, heating could be, uh, you know, sustained over uh, significant periods of time. This is, of, uh, for instance, uh, true for Io, where the Laplace resonance forces Io in, a, in this resonance and uh, with the forced eccentricity uh, that is then keeping uh, the tidal dissipation up. Uh, against, uh, you know, dissipating factors. And then, of course, the transport properties in the interior, the viscosity, which is uh, strongly temperature dependent, but also pressure dependent, which is something that modelers often, you know, uh, neglect uh, because it uh, causes uh, difficulties if you uh, include the pressure dependence, but at least for, uh, we believe that for super Earth, uh, you should account for that. Thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity. Now, um, there are various forms of, uh, uh, of mantle convection that uh, are important for our understanding of uh, terrestrial plants. And, uh, you know, uh, basically we're talking about uh, a stagnant lid uh, convection, intermittent convection, and mobile lid convection. Uh, and here you see, to the right, um, you see a uh, representation uh, of uh, uh, stagnant lid convection and later um, uh, uh, mobile lid convection, where for stagnant lid convection you have um, the, does it work here? You have the convection under, you know, underneath a lid that is keeping stagnant through which the heat is then uh, conducted uh, and transported by conductive uh, conduction outwards. Now this is the mode of uh, 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 convection and uh, then tectonics that is uh, thought to be applicable at least uh, to Mars and Mercury uh, and uh, possibly also to Venus, although to Venus uh, may be in an intermittent uh, regime. But let me first go to uh, the mobile lid convection, you know, where uh, that, that cold near surface layer uh, actually participates uh, in the flow. Uh, and you can see that that would of course have an effect on the interior temperature distribution because uh, what, what happens here is you take that cold stuff and put it down in the deep interior. So you mix it in in the deep interior and thereby you cool the deep interior much more effectively than you would do in a stagnant lid uh, convection uh, a mode. Now, um, uh, plate tectonics, of course, is a difficult process and it has uh, several, um, uh, uh, you know, properties assigned with it, for instance, that the blades move plate-like behavior, but uh, for interior uh, transport, actually, what is important is that it is a, a form of mobile lid convection, where you put, the, where you, 
you know, uh, recycle the near surface layer with uh, uh, the deep uh, interior. And, uh, you know, for the purpose of the heat transfer from the interior, that is the, uh, the uh, decisive uh, element. Now, uh, in between the two, you have uh, intermittent convection, meaning that basically you, go, you are going from a state where uh, you have uh, stagnant lid into uh, mobile lid and, and back again. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, uh, the stagnant lid can become unstable uh, and, uh, you know, participate in the flow, and then it could be stable again, uh, you know, in a, a phase of uh, uh, stagnant lid convection. Uh, and for Venus, for instance, we believe that that might have happened, that it may have, uh, that lithosphere may have become unstable, uh, but that possibly we're looking today at a stagnant uh, lid situation. Um, now, uh, the question of how we understand plate tectonics is still a, a, a matter of lively uh, debate and uh, active research, uh, modeling research. Uh, but there is, I mean, you could, uh, you know, at least understand it in principle, you know, from a chart like this here, a diagram like this, where you have the viscosity contrast, you know, through that layer. Uh, the Rayleigh number measuring basically the thickness uh, of the, the layer or the radius of the planet. Uh, and then uh, another component of rheology, uh, and that is the yield stress. So you can produce these, uh, uh, these charts, as I, you see here on the right-hand side, if you include an elastic plastic rheology. And uh, you, depending on the yield stress, you could actually map out regions where you are in a stagnant lid regime to regions where you are in episodic or the intermittent regime or in this mobile lid regime. At least that is one way of, uh, of uh, you know, successfully uh, you know, modeling that. Uh, and uh, the yield stress uh, you know, is, can be a, fa a function or is a function of uh, water in the interior, so that uh, in the system. So that a conjecture would be that on a planet where water is, uh, you know, abundant such that it can be rheologically uh, important uh, that you would reduce the yield stress and therefore uh, run into that, uh, you know, into that mobile lit regime of plate tectonics. So that would be, you know, one model of explaining, you know, why the Earth would have plate tectonics and Mars and Venus, uh, uh, for instance, would not. Uh, but I should say that there are other um, uh, uh, models uh, out there, uh, but they all, you know, in a way have to do with, uh, with elastic plastic rheologies and the effect, uh, you know, that you would have uh, on uh, elements of, of uh, that rheology. Uh, you cannot uh, do it with a pure viscous rheology. In that case, you would always end up in a stagnant lid regime. Okay. Uh, now, um, in uh, this business, we're looking at a range of uh, sizes uh, and, and masses. Uh, and uh, we're basically started out with uh, the terrestrial planets that are down here. Uh, but, I mean, through missions like uh, Rosetta, Dawn, and others that have brought you know, the asteroids uh, nearer to our uh, you know, data uh, and attention, we're sort of uh, uh, you know, extending the range of sizes of bodies down uh, to uh, the sizes of uh, asteroids, uh, and uh, through uh, the uh, you know research in the detection of exoplanets, uh, we're extending the range you know to uh, higher masses, and of course other planetary systems. And uh, you know, to me, I mean, this is the most significant uh, uh, at the moment, at least, the significant result or uh, come out of uh, exoplanet research. Uh, you know, that we have, you know, or beginning to have at our disposal a much wider range of planetary bodies that we can actually, you know, study. Uh, now let me begin with uh, uh, a little bit of, of work uh, that we recently done on small bodies. I mean, here is a, a chart that summarizes uh, some models that we've, uh, you know, done uh, on Lutetia, uh, you know, using uh, the Rosetta data on uh, Lutetia as, uh, as constraint. Now, uh, the, basically, um, a, an important question that uh, is being asked uh, in, in the community uh, today is whether or not uh, these asteroids, understood also as planetesimals, 
uh, or remnants of uh, the accretion of uh, uh, the planetary system are differentiated here or not. Uh, and um, uh, you could uh, approach this uh, from a uh, thermal uh, point of view uh, by asking yourself, you know, how hot does it get in order to start uh, melting and, uh, and, and differentiation. Uh, and uh, as you can see here on the left-hand side, this is basically a competition uh, between uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, accretion time relative uh, to the formation of the cal calcium uh, aluminum rich uh, inclusions uh, and uh, the accretion duration plotted out here. So if uh, uh, accretion is, uh, is fast uh, and uh, if you start accretion early, then you are ending up uh, in, at this side of the diagram uh, and you can actually, uh, you know, go to a differentiated structure where your small body of uh, a few hundred kilometers size can even heat up such that the melting point of uh, silicates is, uh, or the partial melting point of silicates is, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, reached, uh, and uh, the, of, uh, the, uh, the, the melting point of iron anyway, uh, and you can differentiate and form a core. Uh, while if you start accretion late, uh, and you take a long accretion time, you're basically ending up with uh, a, a undifferentiated uh, body. And you can have, depending on these two parameters, you can basically have uh, anything, anything in between. Uh, and uh, this is another representation of that, uh, where you can basically see, uh, see the same story. Now, um, looking at, at uh, these charts here, um, uh, what, one of the things we've, uh, we've uh, included in this modeling is the partitioning of uh, aluminum-26, uh, which is that, you know, uh, uh, highly, um, you know, active or, I mean, with a high production of uh, heat production rate, but, I mean, short-lived uh, element uh, that uh, isotope that you would have uh, early in, in the solar system. Uh, and you know, most of the modeling that's been done in the literature would not, you know, include partitioning of al aluminum-26 uh, in, in the melt. And we've included that into the modeling, and here are two scenarios where, uh, in one case, uh, partitioning is included, and in the other case here, uh, partitioning is not included. And what you can see is basically that if you keep the aluminum-26 in the body, then you could end up with a magma ocean uh, and, uh, uh, in the interior uh, and uh, uh, keep that magma ocean for some time, depending, of course, on the formation uh, of, uh, of the asteroid and uh, uh, relative to CAI and uh, the uh, and its size. But if you include um, the, uh, different, uh, the partitioning of aluminum-26 into the melt, what happens is that you remove the heat sources you know, from the interior and put it into the crust and in a thin magma ocean. And the basic difference is that then most of the, uh, the asteroid would actually remain solid and the magma ocean that you get would actually be quite thin. Okay, so why are these bodies interesting? Uh, even interesting for somebody who uh, usually is looking at, at larger uh, uh, bodies, of course, I mean, you want to explain some of the observations in the uh, asteroid belt and the meteorite record. Uh, but the, the big question is how small a body can actually be differentiated. Uh, and, um, uh, and then beyond that, half the terrestrial planets form from a differentiated or undifferentiated planetesimals because this is of importance for the early history of uh, terrestrial planets. It makes a difference whether you form a planet uh, from an undifferentiated suit of planetesimals and then have to differentiate it later, or whether you form the planets from uh, differentiated planetesimals uh, and then, uh, you know, you can uh, have uh, core formation much more easily uh, than, uh, you know, in, in the other case. And therefore, it is important to understand, you know, what uh, a typical uh, scenario of uh, f would be for a planetesimal, uh, you know, in its in its early history that would then you know, uh, you know, in be incorporated into a growing planet. And also, of course, I mean, how small a planetary body uh, uh, could could be, you know, to, uh, and and still have a self-sustained uh, magnetic field. Those are questions that are uh, being addressed here. 
Now moving on to uh, larger bodies, uh, here again a, a collection of the, the, the Kepler candidates and you see how uh, you know, large a range of uh, sizes and how densely uh, is, is uh, covered and how densely you know, the, this is populated. Uh, you know, leading to uh, you know, speculations about the uh, chemistry of the systems and possible carbon planets uh, and so forth and so forth. Now, um, here is another uh, look at, at the situation where on the slide on the left-hand side we have uh, compiled you know, all the, uh, the, the planets so far from which we know the radii uh, and the masses and therefore can calculate the densities and uh, uh, and, 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 you know, do some uh, chemistry, actually, uh, cr uh, crude chemistry with them. Uh, and while we know about, I think, about a thousand planets and have three thousands or so uh, planetary candidates, um, the uh, suit of uh, planets from, for which we know the, the density is actually relatively small. Uh, and, and it's mostly gaseous planets that are here, uh, while for Uranus-type uh, planets, I mean, there is a few, uh, and for rocky planets, there is uh, uh, even less. And um, the reason for that is, is illustrated on uh, the right-hand side here. There is a difference in uh, the communities from which you observe planets, uh, for which you get with the radial velocity method, uh, the mass uh, up, up uh, down here, uh, and or with the transit method, uh, the, the, uh, the, the radius. Uh, and at the moment, um, these are distinct reservoirs, so to speak. And there's only a little overlap between the two. And one of uh, uh, the reasons why we're in, in, in Europe, at least, and uh, particularly at, at my institute, uh, are uh, uh, largely involved in the Blato mission is because the Blato mission wants, actually wants to cover that. So it wants to get uh, the range uh, of... Uh, uh, parameters accessible uh, that the radial velocity uh, method uses uh, for detecting uh, exoplanet for uh, the, the transit method so that we would then get a much larger uh, sample of planets from which, for, for which uh, we uh, knew both mass and radii uh, and therefore the density and can uh, do some, you know, at least, uh, you know, crude uh, physics with them. Now, um, uh, let me, uh, you know, try to com uh, compare uh, terrestrial planets with uh, super-Earth planets uh, for the next uh, few slides. Now, uh, terrestrial planets, uh, we can say, are relatively well understood, although, as I said before, uh, the Earth uh, plate tectonics still poses many questions. Uh, but, you know, we still yeah, we know, you know which half plate tectonics are not, and, and we have some understanding of that. Pressure and compression are low in these bodies, much smaller than the critical pressure for then degenerating into a Fermi gas. That means that uh, you know, this is the, the theory that lets you com uh, calculate the maximum size of uh, a planetary body with a given composition uh, and, uh, and so forth. So we're much away from, from this. We're looking at small, cold uh, uh, bodies in, in that sense. Uh, the pressure range in the interior of uh, uh, terrestrial planets in the solar system is largely accessible to experiment and the interpretation of geophysical data allows us insight uh, into the workings uh, of the interior. The rheology is highly complex uh, but uh, it depends on temperature and minor uh, constituents such as water and to a lesser extent CO2 but uh, pressure is not such a factor. I mean, it still is a factor in the, in the Earth interior, uh, but for bodies like Mars, I mean, you could safely do your model calculations without uh, caring too much uh, about um, uh, uh, pressure effects. Uh, and you should also say that, you know, the range of uh, mineralogy that we, you know, have in here is uh, mostly known, at least from experiment. Now, uh, if you uh, look at super-Earth, you're looking at a completely different uh, situation. So um, the pressure range uh, in, in the Earth uh, would only cover the outer shell of a 10, uh, uh, a, 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 a ten uh, um, masses, Earth masses uh, super-Earth. So uh, if you go from here to here, and then this is your mantle of the Earth, and this is your outer layer uh, of, uh, uh, of your super-Earth. 
so uh, we don't uh, ha have a good understanding of the mineralogy of, uh, uh, of the mantle of uh, a super Earth. Uh, we, um, we think that a phase that is uh, being hotly debated for Earth, the post-periscite phase is, uh, uh, you know, would at least, I mean, if there are not post-periscite -post phases, uh, would, uh, you know, be uh, covering, you know, most of uh, the interior of uh, uh, a super Earth. So, um, you know, if we do mineralogy or, um, you know, s equation of state calculations and so forth, we're entering in a regime uh, that is not very well uh, covered by our experimental data. So extrapolations uh, are uh, quite um, you know, substantial. Uh, then there may be phase transitions uh, in the interiors of super Earth that we have no idea of, uh, basically, and not you know, how they would actually then interact with uh, you know, convection in the interiors uh, of uh, these plants. And that you know, has all been appreciated. I mean, if we look at the many models that are you know, discussed in the literature, uh, on the thermal evolution or convection in, in super Earth and the, in the discussion of, uh, uh, of um, plate tectonics on, on super Earth. Now, um, it could also be that uh, uh, the, the, or the, the pressure uh, of, uh, in the interior is actually coming close to uh, uh, the critical pressure. Uh, and therefore, it is not necessarily clear that if there were a differentiation uh, of an iron core and a silicate mantle, that they would not dissolve into each other, or that there would actually be a distinct core from a mantle, you know, which would then, of course, factor into in, in the question whether or not a super Earth could actually generate a magnetic field. Now, here I'm, I'm showing a uh, result of a calculation uh, that we uh, done recently with uh, uh, Vlada Stamenkovic, who's now at MIT, uh, and, and uh, Doris Broy and myself, uh, where we looked at the thermodynamics uh, of uh, uh, very high pressures uh, for uh, rocks. And we tried to calculate, uh, you know, ne next to the melting curve, we tried to calculate the activation volume, transport properties, and thermodynamic properties. But the reason I'm showing you this here is, uh, you know, as one example of uh, the, the curves you're calculating, is to, you know, just demonstrate where you are covered with data and you know, where you are extrapolating. And uh, one has to appreciate that extrapolations in this business are substantial. Now, um, a, discussion, a brief discussion on, uh, uh, and on the question, will there be plate tectonics on, on super Earth? Uh, and uh, what's usually done is uh, that um, you know, the Rayleigh number is calculated uh, for uh, the, the mantle of a super Earth, assuming that it is, uh, you know, differentiated into a mantle and a core. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, the, this is the definition of the Rayleigh number with the thermal expansion coefficient in it, the gravity, the heat uh, uh, production rate, the thickness of the mantle, the thermal conductivity, the thermal diffusivity, and the viscosity. And it's proportional to the ratio between the thickness uh, of the mantle and, and, uh, and the viscosity, basically. Uh, and um, you can uh, then, you know, proceed in, uh, you know, trying to calculate uh, the stress that the convection uh, in the interior of uh, uh, this planet would exert on the lithosphere and ask yourself whether that would then cause the, the lithosphere to uh, founder. Uh, and uh, you know, assuming that there is a, uh, a given uh, yield stress. Uh, and um, uh, that leads you to a, a equation where you can calculate the convective stresses. Uh, that would be proportional to the viscosity to the power of a third, the thickness to a power of seven thirds, and the uh, heat production rate to a power of, uh, of uh, two thirds. Um, now, um, the important thing actually here is what is the thickness of the convecting layer uh, and what is the viscosity of uh, the interior. Uh, and here the pressure dependence of the vis viscosity uh, would enter. Um, it could be that um, the viscosity would increase so rapidly that only part of the mantle, let me go back to this year, only part of the mantle would actually participating in the flow, thereby reducing the effective uh, D substantially. And it could also be that the, the pressure effect could be so large that the viscosity is actually 
relatively high and thereby you know, affecting the convective uh, stresses. And this is uh, you know, uh, shown here uh, in this um, you know, well-known uh, relation of, uh, for the, the viscosity. And uh, here you have the activation volume, which is basically what, what enters in, um, in, in, in this equation. Now, there's a number of studies out there. And they basically can be differentiated between those that incorporate the pressure dependence of the viscosity. And these authors usually uh, are skeptical you know, as, uh, as uh, far as uh, uh, plate tectonics and super earth goes uh, versus those that uh, you know, choose to uh, uh, ignore the pressure dependence. And there, you, know, you increase the Rayleigh number. And then, of course, I mean, everything uh, should, should go uh, towards uh, a tendency towards uh, plate tectonics that uh, is larger. Now, um, here is a, uh, a, another uh, rendering of uh, the problem. I mean, here is uh, the viscosity as a function of pressure in the interior. And here is uh, a viscosity that would only be temperature dependent. And here is uh, a viscosity that would uh, increase with uh, pressure, you know, assuming a reasonable volume of the activation volume. Uh, and you see that there could be substantial increases uh, in the viscosity, leading, if you do a convection calculation, to a layer that is stagnant at the base uh, of uh, the mantle. And that, of course, could have important consequences uh, for the cooling of, uh, of a core and the removal of heat from the core, if there was a core, uh, and, uh, and for the generation of a magnetic field, because the magnetic field is only generated if you subtract heat at a sufficient rate uh, from that core. And if you have that thick stack that layer down there, then possibly you're not uh, having a uh, magnetic field. Now, um, these speculations led us to plot a, uh, a uh, reg regime, excuse me, of, uh, that is uh, defined you know, on one hand by the yield stress, on the other hand by the planetary masses. Uh, and if we put all that in there, uh, the conclusion would be that there is actually a preferred range of masses uh, for planets to have uh, uh, plate tectonics. And that you know, could just happen to be uh, the size of the Earth. That is a speculation. Uh, and that would, of course, then have an effect on the distribution of life in the universe if plate tectonics is, uh, is important for habitability and so forth and so forth. Now, this gives me a, uh, the uh, um, you know, chance to, uh, go, to uh, enter into my next and final point, uh, planets and uh, life. Uh, and um, here I show on the right-hand side uh, I show this famous uh, graph by uh, Hastings about the evolution of, uh, uh, of um, the chemistry of uh, the, at uh, the atmosphere and the rise of oxygen. Uh, and, um, and also plotted into there uh, two models of uh, the growth of the continents on Earth. Uh, and if you buy this uh, model here, then there was actually uh, the formation of the continent started, or the growth of the continent started before life was formed at about that time here. Uh, but um, if you believe in this model here, you could say that there is at least you know, a, a gross timely relation uh, between uh, the uh, formation of life and uh, the growth of continents. And others, like uh, uh, Rosing and, and uh, Norm Sleep and others, have uh, you know, speculated about a relation between life and uh, the formation of continents. Now, we put our own model uh, in, in the debate here. Uh, it's a paper that's currently in, uh, under review. Uh, and uh, the, it uh, works basically like that. It looks at uh, the, uh, the functioning of, the sediment of sedimentation or erosion in the, uh, the gross uh, geochemical water cycle and other elements. So uh, what you have here is basically subduction. You know, then you have the mid-oceanic ridges. Uh, you have erosion of the continents uh, and uh, the transfer of uh, you know, material from the continents uh, to the oceans. And you have that thick sedimentary layer. And what we do with the sedimentary layer is we regard it as a, as a um, medium that can store water at, on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is less permeable uh, as uh, the rock underneath. And thereby, it can seal off uh, the, the porous uh, uh, you know, uh, ocean, uh, crust layer that is underneath. So if you had a thick enough layer of, of sediments, uh, then uh, you could basically seal off the, the, the uh, 
oceanic crust against uh, early dewatering and uh, thereby introduce water at a higher rate into the interior uh, as you would if that layer were not there. And uh, we life we have in there because uh, we assume that uh, life factors in the erosion rate, that the erosion rate is uh, to a large extent governed you know, by the action of uh, plants and microorganisms uh, on, uh, continent, on the continental crust. Okay, um, now the elements of the theory then are continental erosion, enhanced by bioactivity, feeds sedimentary basins. Sedimentary layer blocks the watering of the crust. Water released when hydrous minerals break down feeds andesite source region. And acidic volcanism produces uh, continental crust. And the remaining water is injected into the mantle and is part of the mantle water budget. Now, the water in the mantle is important because it reduces the mantle viscosity and enhances the rate of operation of the tectonic engine and the, the rate of cycling of, uh, uh, of the crust. And water is released through the crust in the atmosphere at mesoceanic ridges. Now, uh, in, in another uh, uh, rendering of this, I mean, here you have the subducting crust, you have the sedimentary layer, uh, you have uh, the dewatering that is indicated here, free water that is uh, stored in pores and water that is in minerals. There is some dewatering here early on as you go into the subduction uh, and then there is a breakdown of uh, uh, watery minerals, uh, you know, and the water is released and into the melt uh, regime for andesitic crust that produces continental uh, material. And we've all feed that into a set of equation. Uh, and look for steady states. And uh, what we're finding is that there is a steady state defined by um, two lines. This is the line that where the continental surface area, uh, the rate of change of the continental surface area is zero, with mean, production and consumption by erosion, and the, the line where uh, the, mod, um, the mantle water content uh, is, uh, uh, the rate of change with time is zero, and that defines an equilibrium point. Uh, and that would be stable. And that is tuned in our models such that you get the present Earth out of it. I mean, 40% uh, coverage and uh, 300 about uh, 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 ppm water in the mantle. Now, if we, and, and any deviation of that would lead the system into that stable point. Now, if we uh, reduce uh, the sedimentation rate, then we find uh, two new equilibrium points. Uh, a stable point down here at an earth that is, uh, has a small uh, coverage of con with continents and a small water content, uh, and an unstable point that uh, you know, uh, is, is over here that you know, cannot be attained. And any start out of the system would move you either into that <coughs> equilibrium point or this one over there. And um, what I show you here is a uh, if we further decrease uh, the um, sedimentation rate, then these lines change and the, and the equilibrium point al points also change uh, as I reduce the, um, the sedimentation rate. Now I'm showing you uh, a, a uh, model calculation that would look at the system and would calculate the evolution of uh, the water mantle content uh, and the continental surface area as a function of time. And we start out with an abiotic Earth, and what we see in this uh, part of the, the, uh, the plane here is only the curve uh, for uh, the water. The continent curve is uh, somewhere out there. And uh, then we move on, and you see that the, uh, uh, the continents uh, start, start to grow. Uh, and further, uh, and uh, now, now we're coming to a situation where we then artificially you know, start life and we move down to a, hot, li a larger sedimentation rate which we assume is bio biogenically uh, you know, generated. Uh, and here is a, a larger uh, area of this uh, slide here and you can see I mean, the, the water curve uh, and the continental curve here. We go down further, go down further, go down further, and now we, we uh, you know, start time again, and we uh, see that the, um, um, you know, the, the system has moved here. Now it, uh, uh, with the larger sedimentation rate, it moves up, and the continental production rate becomes uh, steeper, 
and you move uh, up basically at constant water content until you get uh, to basically the present time. And here you are very close to that uh, stable equilibrium point. And uh, you know, this is basically where your continents end, uh, of course, because the model is tuned that way, at your 40% surface coverage. Uh, now, if uh, we um, had not switched on life, so to speak, we would end with a surface coverage of the continents that would be here. So if you have questions of time allowed, I could always show a movie that would sort of show you how in that case uh, everything would evolve. Okay, now that brings me to my conclusions. So, I mean, I covered a large range of uh, topics here, and um, the first is planetesimals may be differentiated depending on their accretion rate and time, and the time of the beginning of accretion relative to CAI. The state of matter in the deep interior of massive rocky plants is not well known and extreme and depends, uh, you know, extremely on your, on your modeling. Uh, the way the tectonic engine works on massive rocky plants is not known, but should be affected by the pressure effects on the viscosity, which are debated. I mean, there is, uh, you know, also a claim out there, Carrato, for instance, thinks that possibly, uh, you know, there might be effects that would mediate the, the pressure effect. Okay. Uh, and uh, then there could be a feedback between the interior evolution of a planet and life. Life may stabilize plate tectonics because we believe that if you're in a situation here where you have a low water content and a small surface coverage that possibly would not even have uh, plate tectonics, which in turn may stabilize the habitability of a planet. And with that, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your attention. Tillman, could I start with the questions? Um, yeah. So uh, could you outline um, just in a little bit more detail how the life affects the erosion and sedimentation? Okay. So in, an increase in uh, life on the planet. Basically what we, well, there, there, there are two effects that could actually uh, uh, be at work here. The first, uh, you know, and that is the only one we include in here is that uh, the, sed the sedimentation or the erosion rate is increased, you know, if you have, you know, living things on the surface of continents, okay? And that is a well-established, you know, uh, fact, basically, that, you know, er the erosion rate is uh, depending on the bioactivity on, on, uh, on continents. There's another possible effect that uh, could also add in the same direction is that, um, microbes could, um, you know, factor in the incorporation of water in minerals uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the subducting slab uh, by reducing the activation energy for, you know, some mineralogy reaction, like this mectide illite transition. But we did not include that in this calculation here. Uh, it would go in the same direction. We just, you know, have. Uh, uh, the assumption, the model assumption in here that between abiotic earth and a biotic earth, you increase the, uh, the, the sedimentation rate by a factor of n, and we varied that over uh, you know, some range, but I think the calculation I showed here have, have about a factor of two in there. What, what about a uh, super earth that had stagnated at a stromatolite phase, for example? What about, know, what? Uh, what about a super earth that had stagnated at a stromatolites phase that didn't have a lot of earth on uh, a lot of animals on the continents, for example, to increase the erosion rate? Okay, then uh, you know, based on yeah, these model back. calculations, yeah, yeah, yeah. bad luck. Okay, okay. Another question. <laughs> Um, recent results from Mars suggest that the planet had liquid water and that the water persisted for millions of years long enough to lay down sedimentary rock layers. Yeah. Um, our model of the sun suggests that this is not consistent and yeah. the answer would appear to be geothermal heating. Yeah. I get numbers on the order of 200 watts per square meter of geothermal heating being required to keep the planet liquid water. I wouldn't know how to, how to do that. <laughs> that. That's the question. Yeah, no. Uh, if you had that, first question is, mm. would that amount of geothermal power coming out of the ground be consistent with the radioactive burden of the planet? And second, what would that do to the upper layers of the rock? 
Um, okay, Th those are two questions that you cannot easily answer without you know doing some calculations. But you know, you know, based on on my earlier you know thermal evolution models for for Mars, you know, I would, I mean, at the time we actually arrived in, at at higher you know. Um, uh, heat flow values for the present day that are now, you know, uh, received by from model calculations. Basically, depending on uh, on the Urey ratio story and and the amount of radiogenic heating you have in the interior, you assume for the interior of Mars, which is not really known. I mean, if you have to go there and measure the heat flow, okay. But I would think, I mean, the the present best estimate for the present heat flow on Mars would be twenty milliwatts uh, per meter squared. Now assume that that is like the Earth, that the Urey ratio is about 0.5, okay, and therefore, you know, um, you know the, um, uh, the the radiogenic heating rate would only be half of it, and uh, uh, and and then you have your usual radiogenic decay uh, over the 4.5 billion years that brings you to something like a factor of three. Let's take five, you know, and and then you're you're arriving at something like like 50 plus, you know, as a heat flow estimate for uh, for early Mars, and that would be you know significantly smaller than your 200 milliwatt per per meter squared. I I would think, you know, so um, I would be doubtful that you could actually you know explain it, it that way. I mean, I've seen other models that you know work with uh, atmospheric chemistry. Uh, and which are not entirely successful, but I think uh, Jim Castings and, and colleagues have come up with uh, scenarios that you know could explain you know an, an early warmer atmosphere you know in the situation of a the faint young sun basically. Right. Yeah. But you know my take at this would be that I would be very doubtful that you could actually solve the problem with a higher surface heat flow from the interior. Could I ask the next question? Sure. Uh, I'd like to hear more about the Venus crust. I hear, hear that some people think it might be foundering, yeah. uh, that the SO2 in the atmosphere might represent some uh, off, off uh, shoot of that. Can you tell us what the current situation is in understanding the situation with the Venus crust? Okay, my, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm um, exactly the best the best person to answer that question, but let me let me try. <laughs> uh, okay, the, um, um, the the well, the data we have on the on the surface rock a record of impacts, you know, have been interpreted uh, in terms of a model that would have a foundering of the Venusian crust. Uh, what was that? 500 million years ago, something like that. Now, that is model dependent and has been put into question by others, you know, who, who say, well, of course, I mean, the surface record is undebated, but, uh, you know, it depends on, on the, uh, you know, the, the rate of uh, impacts and, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and your dating of, uh, uh, of the, or your interpretation of the crater, uh, cratering record uh, you know, is uh, questionable, and it could be that you know that active uh, uh, the, the the recycling had occurred over much la larger periods of time, uh, and um, uh, yeah. Consider a mobile wind, is that right? Uh, well, uh, I think in, in in both cases, I mean, you would actually you you have no indication of anything that resembles plate tectonics uh, there at at the present time or, or if if very little uh and uh, the best explanation would be you know that you had a foundering of the lithosphere and that the the crust the, the lithosphere and the crust has been renewed now whether that occurred you know in in one event or you know over a longer time is is actually uh is actually debated but uh i think there is a consensus uh, you know that this is not an ongoing process at this present time. Okay. I don't know of that uh, part of your question, at least. Um, Tom, we have a little more time, so I'm going to indulge myself and ask another question. Um, could you talk about uh, the way that the understanding of the giant planets uh, of our solar system, their cores and slash mantles, have developed, and 
how super earths might in the same way um, have a core and, and mantle that's not well defined. Um, you mentioned that in your talk several times, if the core is actually there in the super earth model. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, first of all, I mean, the giant planets in our solar system are mostly hydrogen helium uh, spheres with, uh, with um, cores of uh, rock and iron and other stuff. Uh, the mass of which is debated. I mean, there is, uh, you know, models that are basically interpreting the, the, the gravity field of, of these planets and, uh, you know, using equation of state modeling. And uh, although there has been, you know, substantial uh, progress in, in modeling the equations of state of, uh, of hydrogen and helium over the past years, uh, there is still a wide range uh, of, of uh, pos you know, uh, uh, of interpretation possible. So uh, anything between zero, which is you know a little extreme possibly, but up to ten Earth masses has been spe is speculated, uh, you know, to be uh, the core of of these these rocky planets. Now um, the the reason I I mentioned. Um, this um, the, 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 the question uh, the, or the question of whether or not a differentiated uh, a super Earth would actually have a core uh, is basically twofold. I mean, one reason is that you know with you know we're, we're sort of you know, transferring our knowledge from the Earth, you know, in a in a much smaller pressure, uh, you know, to uh, the interior of a super Earth, where we are in a pressure range where uh, you know other factors may matter, and uh, where the solubility of uh, iron in in silicates could actually uh, you know be substantial, such that you would not you know have a clear distinction between a iron core and a silicate and a, and a rocky mantle. So they could you know dissolve into each other. Uh, and the other uh, question that we, we uh, uh, would have, or the other reason for possibly doubting this, is uh, that um, the, vis the, the uh, pressure dependence of the viscosity and the melting point uh, would actually um, make you think of whether or not you can have that process of differentiation that we believe is ha has happened on, on, the, on the Earth, where you know, you had your iron layer near the top, and then you had the Rayleigh-Taylor instability bringing the iron down uh, and, and moving the, the rock up and so forth. But if you have a, a very highly viscous uh, deep interior, uh, then you, you're possibly stuck in that, in that process. Um, you could, could argue that, well, you know, if you get it hot enough, then in the end it, it, it would, uh, you know, get viscous, uh, uh, you know, uh, of low viscosity enough. But, I mean, the... the uh, the time constant for warming up the deep interior of a super Earth is uh, is substantial. I mean, it is uh, you know larger than um, the age of of those planets, and uh, you know therefore that is doubtful. Hi, Jack. <laughs> Hello, Tillman. Very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, if you are not making a core. Are yeah. you making a crust, or is your uranium and thorium also fully mixed down? I, I would think that you, I mean, you have a much better chance of making a crust because, I mean, in the outer layers of, uh, uh, of your super Earth, I mean, we're, we're speculating terribly here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the outer layer of the crust, I mean, of, of, the, of the planet, I mean, you are at, you know, um, you know, if you, if you take like 20% like or so, you know, of the, of the radial extent of it, you're in the, in the range of pressures in the Earth. And you could, of course, think that, you know, you would have an outer layer that would be convecting, you know, just, just like uh, the interior of a terrestrial planet would, and then have partial melting and, and so forth, you know, uh, and, and uh, differentiate a, a crust and so forth. So I, I would, you know, if I may speculate that uh, to that extent, I would. Uh, think that yes, I mean you could have a basaltic crust um, and and uh, in a, and a mantle, but underneath, I mean in the deep interior, I mean things become much more fuzzy and uh, difficult, uh, hard and hardly understood, and uh, we're not clear what, what's hap what, what's happening down there. So I mean if you there's this, this you know this classical paper by Francis Burge in the, the 50s that says you know how fuzzy you get as you go into the deep interior of the Earth. 
uh, and, and that, of course, is <laughs> uh, even fault? more relevant for it. Yeah. it. It sounds like if you look at the top, it has a crust. Yeah. But if you look at the radioactive elements in the core, yeah. then they don't get sent to the crust. They would stay yeah. down. Yeah. I, I would, so I would have speculate a that. Heat flow yeah. To deal yeah, 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 yeah. I would speculate that. They could be locked in there. Yeah. I want to ask a question about the water that you're talking about. That affects the viscosity yeah. that you, you point out. Uh, sometimes you think maybe the water comes originally from the material that builds the planet. Yeah. And what you've shown here is that you may have water on the surface, yeah. but that may not get down into the mantle yeah. because you've got a separation. Yeah. So yeah. how do you, do you, you consider the water balance that you have in the, yeah. uh, okay. in the mantle uh, steady state, or is it something that's evolving with time? Okay, now in, in this model calculation, we assume a steady state and we assume that we start out with some initial concentration of, of water. But you're asking a, a very you know, valid question of, uh, uh, of uh, the way water is incorporated in the Earth. And there, there basically there are uh, two models at the present time. Uh, you know, one where the water came late and was just added to the plant that was basically already there. Or, uh, you know, the other model has, uh, you know, watery planetesimals being incorporated in, in, uh, in the interior. And therefore, the Earth, after being finished, quote unquote, yeah, has a, a certain amount of water incorporated in it. Now, my, my personal uh, belief is actually that I, 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 uh, I have a hard time seeing that if you add the water late on a, on a dry planet, now how do you get it in the interior? I mean, I have a hard time, uh, you know, understanding that. And therefore, you know, I would lean towards uh, those models, of Morbidelli's and others that, you know, have a water component, you know, in the, the material that, you know, makes the, the plans to begin with and not this late addition of the water on top. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> tell me we have... Uh, uh, this is uh, actually wow. the, uh, a, special, a special black mug. Are it's, we alone? <laughs> yes. And it's our last Are We Alone mug, so that's why it's significant. Um, oh, okay. Thank so, you very, um, very much. <laughs> please join me in giving uh, Tom and a round of Thank you. Thank you. If you have any more, more we'll detailed questions, please feel free to, or yeah. less detailed questions. <laughs> <laughs> this, will, this will have a special place on my shelf for months.